Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I said, it's good to be home. I did pajama church last Sunday, so I caught up with everything. Thank you, Daniel, for a wonderful sermon. And it really was pajama church, because I was in Oregon, and it was very early there. And so I had my coffee and my little Airbnb and, and watched you. I saw Tom was back. That was good to see. See, I check on you. I can recognize you from the back of your heads. I just thought I'd tell you that. Well, last week, whether you know it or not, we started looking at what I like to call the greatest hits of Jesus. Daniel did a wonderful job unpacking the story of the doubting Thomas. And we'll continue for the next couple of weeks to look at some of these greatest hits. And we call these scriptures the greatest hits of Jesus, or perhaps a better phrase would be the immortal short stories of the world, because they're all so familiar to us, whether we realize it or not. They're all verses that have helped f shape our faith, whether we know it or not. You know, they're like that song that you just can't get out of your head, or that movie that you see that changes your view of the world. So our greatest hit today is the story of Luke on that first Easter, that afternoon when Jesus appeared to two disciples who were walking along the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. The story begins at midday with these two sorry disciples who probably think they have bet on the wrong savior. It says while they were walking, they discussed all that had happened. <laughs> that is probably the greatest biblical understatement I have ever heard. <laughs> I just can't even begin to imagine what they were saying. How incredibly disappointed they must have been. What do they do now? Where were they headed? Back to the fishing nets, the tax offices, to the missed appointments, to the routine of their life. They had such great, incredible expectations about what this Jesus was going to bring to the world. They were expecting a different outcome, weren't they? Expectations are like that. And I have to admit that I got an emotion-filled hold my tongue and breathe lesson about expectations when I was coming home from my vacation. All the while knowing what it was I was going to preach on and I couldn't help myself. You see, my favorite term for traveling is uneventful, right? <laughs> I like it to be uneventful. And so I decided to fly an airline, which shall go nameless, as a result of a nationwide debacle they experienced. And so instead I chose an airline that I hadn't flown in years, but I remember it as being exceptional. And it was, I was so proud of myself, I'd been such a great decision. And it was uneventful, indeed. And then I got this fabulous rental car that could take me up in the mountains. I had a darling little Airbnb. I enjoyed stellar weather and fabulous outings and walks and enjoyed some wonderful company with friends that I've known for decades and decades. Then the vacation was over. And my calm, serene, this is how life is going to be, blew up. First of all, I got to the airport at the crack of dawn, like they tell you to do, only to find out that my flight was delayed. and I might miss my connection in Salt Lake to get home to Houston. To the point that if I missed it, I wasn't gonna get home until the middle of the night. Well, you know what I did with that. And then there were all the other passengers, okay? We get on the plane and the, they announce, they say, look, we've got some tight connections in Salt Lake, so we really encourage you to sit down and wait and let the people who are making connections get off first. Can I share that they don't do that? <laughs> and so I'm trying to stay calm, you know, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not doing very well. I'm trying to not say anything. 
And I was, you know, everybody was going to hear about this if I missed that connection. I didn't miss the connection. Now, I did have to walk really, really fast from gate one to gate 17, and I'm praying there's no video of it. <laughs> but I made my connection. But I worked myself up pretty good, didn't I? Exactly what was going to happen if I didn't make that connection. Like, what was, you know, what was going to happen? I was just getting home late. <laughs> Expectations are a funny thing. We put so much on them. And weren't those disciples, those two men walking along the road to Emmaus, weren't they full of expectations? We read in Acts that they said to Peter, what are we to do? And that same question comes up with the two on the road to Emmaus. They must have been asking themselves, how did this happen? How did this happen? These two disciples, as a result of their preoccupation with their own immediate difficulties, they're full of sadness and hopelessness. And as a result, they're seemingly prevented from seeing God's redemptive purpose in the things that had happened. They're shattered and they're heartbroken. And Jesus approaches and begins to walk along with them. And as they walked, Jesus explained to them the meaning of all the scriptures concerning himself. I would have loved to have heard that conversation. Don't you know it was all about them? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Jesus. And oh, that's good, you know. But they didn't know who he was, did they? They were just all caught up in what was going on. But then they get to Emmaus and Jesus took the bread and broke it. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized Jesus. And then they remembered how their hearts had burned as he talked along the road. But then he disappeared, right? But what did they do? They immediately go back to Jerusalem to tell the others what they'd encountered. It's a simple yet profound story. And I want to focus for just a few minutes on three elements of this story. The first one is, why couldn't they recognize Jesus? And then second, what was it about the breaking of the bread that they saw him? And finally, what's the significance that what they do immediately is they go back and tell the others? So why were they kept from seeing? Was it done to them or was it done by them? Was their inability to recognize or see Jesus an act of God somehow? Or was it intentional for some greater purpose? Or could it have been a result of the disciples' own humanness? One of my favorite homiletics professors at SMU, Alice McKenzie, she wrote this reflection on this scripture. She said, they say misery loves company. I think it's true. In the hospital nursery, it's called social crying. One baby starts crying and all the rest follow suit. In the workplace, one person complains and others join in. In family disputes, one person gathers others around and vents a grievance and they all unite in their shared sense of hurt at the hands of another family member. Misery loves company. These disciples are immersed in their own sadness. And who can blame them? Who can blame them? We know the dynamics of grief. The disciples deserve the dignity of gr their grief and perhaps the benefit of the doubt. We all know what that's like. And we get caught up in our grief and our sadness. <clears throat> and we have a hard time seeing. But is it just possible that their grief had blinded them temporarily? to what we call this resurrection hope. They're in a place that loss is all that they're willing to embrace. Their spirits are completely at the mercy of what they perceive to be their failed hopes. Their faith is hindered by what they consider to be insufficient evidence of the resurrection. Because what do they say? They recount 
to this stranger the odd events that the women reported. But they conclude some of our number went to the tomb and found it to be just as the women said, but they didn't find Jesus. Mackenzie goes on to offer these profound thoughts. She says, I'm not talking about a dark night of the soul or a state of depression. I'm talking about the spiritual condition of habitually expecting failure and sorrow where we've been promised victory and joy. I'm talking about waking up every morning and heading for the garden tomb looking for the corpse. How far down the road will we go with these misery loved company disciples on the road to Emmaus before we say no to negativity, pessimism, and unfounded hopelessness and say yes to the presence of the risen Christ walking by their side? What should we do when we reach wit's end? When once we thought was worth our lives has been washed up emotionally, financially, physically, spiritually. I maintain every one of us in this room has been there. We've had those moments when we thought it was all over. And what do we do with it? I hope that we have the power to say yes, say yes to hope, yes to the resurrection, and yes to being present in our own lives. I think Alice McKenzie's on to something, that that's why the disciples couldn't see. They were too caught up in their own grief. And so, but they recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. What we've done with that is we've turned that into the sacrament. But it wasn't the sacrament. It was an ordinary meal in an ordinary house. But we've kind of raised it up. And I love sacrament, don't get me wrong. This is the first church I've ever attended that didn't do communion every Sunday. So I grew up with it. I've done it for decades. But that's not what was happening here. It was just an ordinary meal at an ordinary house. But they'd stopped whining, hadn't they? They'd stopped complaining. They were finally paying attention. So if we view this story of the breaking of the bread that it's about sacrament, where does that leave us? Sunday morning Christians? Or worse, first Sunday of the month Christians? <laughs> if that's all it's about. Once we say yes to being present, what other ways can we recognize God? Can we recognize Jesus and the presence of the Spirit in our lives? It goes in tandem with being able to see Christ in the world in the first place, paying attention to the moments that are the breaking of the bread moments, moments that are happening all around us. Don't we all have breaking of the bread moments? They're, they happen to us all the time if we can see them. And once we accept that we have the power to say yes, and that we have the power to embrace the breaking of the bread moments, it becomes clear that we are not meant to do it alone. So they couldn't see in the beginning, too caught up. Then they stop complaining. They recognize who Jesus is, and it disappears. And then when Jesus is no longer in view, the disciples begin to talk with one another. And what do they say? Weren't our hearts burning inside of us as this one talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? What do they do? Well, you know, years ago, Hillary Clinton wrote a book called It Takes a Village. And we've kind of made fun of her and made fun of the book ever since, I know. But the idea behind it was prophetic, that it takes more than a nuclear family in order to raise children. It takes a village. We know that, don't we? We've incorporated this perspective, this idea, into the way we raise our children in the faith. Parents present their children for baptism, promising to raise them in the community of faith. That's why we do it in church. And we show you the children. And we say, this is your church family. Isn't it just amazing to do a baptism of kids? In fact, and what we do in turn with this community of faith with these children is we promise them 
that we're going to embrace them and that we're going to play a supporting role in the raising up of the children. It's a central feature of what it means to be the community of faith for generations. We know it takes a village to raise children. Why would we think then that it would be any different for our own faith journey? All of us continue to develop our faith long after childhood. Life doesn't stay in one place, which means that the faith we had as children must grow stronger in order to meet the testing and trial that comes to us all. The fact of the matter is we are all continually developing in our faith. And yet because we live in a culture that values self-sufficiency and independence, we tend to approach our faith journey as if we're essentially on our own. We seem to think that we can either or should keep our faith struggles, our, our questions, our doubts, our uncertainties, and even our confusion to ourselves. But the reality is that faith has always been a community endeavor. From the very beginning, we find the early Christians gathering together and sharing with each other the bewildering experiences they've had with the risen Christ. Read the book of Acts. It's the story of the, of the making of a church. They did it together. They didn't grow apart. You know, it's one thing for the disciples who raised from Golgotha to the upper room in Jerusalem to hide. It's another thing altogether for the disciples on that road to Emmaus who ran seven miles back to share the good news with the others. And let me tell you, seven miles in Israel is, is pretty tough. It's pretty rocky, dry and deserty. But they couldn't wait to get back and share what they'd seen. And when they got there, they shared what had happened to them. And the result is that in the sharing, they were supporting and encouraging and strengthening each other's faith. Because the reality is faith flourishes in community. There is something about faith that it needs to be carried out in the presence of all of God's people in order to thrive. Henry Nouwen put it this way, Christian community is the place where we keep the flame of hope alive among us. That's how we dare to say that God is a God of love when we see death and destruction and agony all around us. We say it together. We affirm it in each other. Just as in every other aspect of human development, it takes a village for us to sustain a thriving and growing faith. It takes a community to hold on to the faith that God is working to bring grace and peace and mercy and love to this life and every life in the midst of the world. I think that's why COVID was so hard on us, because we were so isolated. You know, things were tough enough. We were so divided before, and it just exacerbated it. It was so isolating. And, and goodness knows, I love my little house and my cats and being alone there as much as anybody, but whew, I kind of got tired of their company. <laughs> it was hard. But what did we do in the midst of that isolation? We turned on a dime and got worship online, didn't we? We started the growth groups. They were a salvation during COVID. It takes a community. We don't do this alone. Our experience of life in this world is such that we always have to keep learning what it means to have faith. And that doesn't typically happen when we try to go alone. Faith is something that thrives and grows in the sharing of it. So this story of Jesus' encounter with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it shows us that we can be present to the hope that through the Spirit we can recognize the presence of God throughout our lives and that we have been intended to make this journey and travel together in community. I pray it, it will be so.